So what we're going to do today is we're going to wrap up our discussion of Java barrier synchronization mechanisms. If you recall before, we talked about the countdown latch, which is a fairly simple mechanism. We talked about cyclic barriers. So countdown latches allow you to be able to do uh, one-shot things that have a fixed number of parties. Cyclic barriers let you do cyclic things with a fixed number of parties. And now we're going to talk about Java Phaser, which is a much more powerful mechanism than either of the other two. So like the other ones that implements Java barrier synchronization, it appeared in Java 7. So you'd have to get newer versions of Java in order to run this. It's best suited for variable sized either cyclic or exit barriers. Keep in mind that there's you know, several different types of barriers. There's entry barriers where you block people to getting into something, kind of like the example we used of going to a store, waiting until it's open. There's exit barriers, which are basically blocking until things are done, kind of like leaving the store. And then there are these cyclic barriers, which allow you to be able to do things in cycles. And so the phaser can be used for a bunch of stuff, but it's primarily focused on variable size things, where the parties can come and go over time. If you have fixed size stuff, then phasers are probably overkill. I and mean, you can use them for fixed size stuff. I'll show you some examples of how you could use them for fixed size stuff. But you might as well just use one of the easier mechanisms because they're much less convoluted. Uh, the phaser is remarkable in its expressivity. And I actually had a lot of fun trying to think of some um, metaphors. I'll try to work in an example from Disney World's Darth Vader exhibit as one of the metaphors. So we'll see if I can make that work. Have you ever done Darth Vader exhibit at Disney World? It does not apply the bridge pattern. And it does not implement an interface. So it's, again, these are this sort of special purpose thing. It was actually based on some uh, mechanisms that were provided in the X window system a long time ago. So it has a couple of constructors. And they're used to make a new object that has an initial phase count of 0. Now, the phase count, think of the phase count as basically the cohort that current threads who want to block on this thing use to dictate whether they block or not, or whether they're part of that cohort. So you all know what a cohort is. Like when you come in as a freshman, that's your cohort, the people who kind of trundle along with you year by year till many of you graduate. So the phase number starts at 0. When you make an object, it starts out with a count, a phase count of 0. And every time it advances, it goes to the next phase number. So that's how you kind of know what phase you're in. And you'll see that this has lots of cool mechanisms for dictating whether you're in the right phase or not. So that's one thing, phase number of 0. By default, any thread using this type of a phaser, one that's created with no parties at all, will need to register for it first. So this is something that's a little bit different from the earlier barrier synchronization mechanisms. Countdown latches, cyclic barriers, you had to tell it how many parties were involved when you created the, the uh, barrier. With a phaser, you don't have to tell it anything. You can tell it stuff if you want to. You can give it a parties count. And the parties count indicates the number of parties that need to show up before the phase can go to the next phase. However, this is optional. You don't have to do this, or, and this isn't necessarily even the, the most that you, you'll have. This is just a starting point. And you can come along later, as you'll see in a second as we talk about some of the other methods. You can register other parties without having to give the initial count. So that's one of the main differences. You can register on the fly. OK. There's a whole bunch of methods. So one of the other things that, that's obvious about this is that it's also got a lot more stuff in it. Um, so the original, the other earlier two mechanisms, things like uh, countdown latch and cyclic barrier, they had just a handful of methods, like await or countdown or await and reset. Right? They're very, very simple interfaces. In contrast, the phaser has a lot more stuff. And I didn't even show like half the methods. There's still a whole pile more that are, are done for various things. The, the methods enable parties to register, synchronize, and terminate. And we'll talk about each of those things in turn. So the first set of methods allow unarrived parties to register. So an unarrived party is a party that hasn't shown up yet. They haven't shown up to wait. They've just shown up to register. And there are two forms of registration. There's the register one, you know, register me, basically. And then there's the bulk register, where you can give a pile of parties all at once. 
The number of registered parties dictates when the phaser can advance. So at the point when people start to wait on stuff, then that's going to dictate when things can be released. So the parties have to be registered first, and then when enough parties have waited, arrived and waited, as we'll see what it, those mean, arrived and waited, when that equals the count of parties, then advancement is considered. You might be able to move to the next level. OK, so that's one set of things. The more interesting set of methods are the arrive and await advance methods. And you can see there are a bunch of them. And the reason there are a bunch of them is they separate out the notion of arriving from the notion of waiting. Now, this is completely unlike the other synchronization mechanisms, which combine arriving and waiting. There's no distinction. So barrier uh, phasers allow you to be able to arrive separately from waiting. So I was trying to think, what's an example of arriving that's different from waiting? And the example I thought of, if you ever go to Disney World and you want to do the Darth Vader exhibit. So there's this really cool Darth Vader thing. I know because we took my son there when he was like four and he really loved it. So you get to go out and you get to be a Jedi Knight for an hour and you get to like duel with Darth Vader. Right? Very, very popular thing. So when you get to Disney World, what do you do? The first thing you do when you get in the gate is you run as fast as you can over to the place where they have the Darth Vader thing and you arrive and then you go ahead and you register yourself. You, you put your name in the list of people because there's so many people who want to do this. So whoever gets there in the first you know, groups, they get to put themselves in the, the list of people who are going to be um, able to duel with Darth Vader. And what they get back, they get back a little slip that says, you are in this group, right? You, know, you come back at 11 o'clock, right? So when you arrive, you get something back. And then when you come back later, then you can go ahead and wait for your turn to go and be with Darth Vader. So the idea here, of course, is you don't want people to be standing around all day waiting for dueling with Darth Vader. You want them to go and register. You arrive. And then you can go off and do whatever you want. And you come back. And now you can go ahead and wait. So they separate out the waiting from the arriving. And that's kind of what is done here. So when you arrive, you can arrive at the phaser without actually waiting for the others to arrive. And you'll get back the phase number. You'll get back the current phase number. Or if the phase is terminated, you get back a negative number. It says, oh, sorry, the ride is closed or whatever, right? You know, or the ride is full or whatever the, right, whatever the right answer is. OK, so you arrive and you get back something that says, this is your arrival number. You're part of this cohort, right? And then at some point, and you could do this right away, or you could go off and do something else for a while, you can then do the await advance call. Await, in await advance, you give a phase number, which you better have gotten back from arrive, by the way. And what will happen here is this will then wait for all the other parties to show up who are part of that phase. So it's kind of like, you know, this is sort of a little bit of an exaggeration, but you, you, know, you show up for your Darth Vader session and you kind of wait for everybody to show up before you go and fight Darth Vader. In reality, if you don't show up right away, they'll like, cancel your, <laughs> your thing. That's where the metaphor falls apart. But, <laughs> but uh, phasers are a little bit more patient. So in this case, you have to wait. And if you give a phase that's the wrong phase, like it's an earlier phase, you, know, you missed your turn or whatever, then it returns immediately and says, sorry, buddy, you didn't get in. So you're in the wrong phase. OK, so then there's also a method, which is actually the one I like to use, because it worked for my example with my thread gang, arrive and await advance. So that combines arriving and awaiting. So it has the same basic effect as calling arrive followed by await advance. All right, so those are the, the three different methods that you can use. We'll be using this one for our example, but the other ones exist too. There's another method for, and, and, and by the way, all the ones we just looked at, those are all synchronization related methods. This one is sort of the opposite of register. This is arrive and deregister. So it's kind of like you show up and you say, I don't really want to go after all. I'm going to cancel. So that means that you know, there's less people who are going to be part of that cohort. right? So arrive and deregister say, I'm no longer interested. Now you have to arrive in order to deregister because you already had had to have uh, you had already had to have you know sort of gotten you've already had to register yourself so you can't deregister 
until you register. And when you arrive and deregister, that means that you no longer want to be counted as one of the parties who's waiting. So that drops by one. So the future phases don't have to consider you when they decide when they have enough parties to go to the next phase, to advance to the next phase. That's the name of it, advancing. All right. And then the last method we're going to talk about is a really interesting method. It's called on advance. And what on advance does is it's a, it's a hook method. Now, does anybody know what a hook method is? What is a hook method? Lawrence. Oh, it's, it hooks you into the template method pattern. Right. So what it basically does is it's a callback that's invoked by another method. And when it's called back, it gives you a chance to override or customize the behavior in some way. The default behavior of on advance is basically to check to see if there's any parties registered. And if they're none, then it says terminate the phaser. Because at this point, we just got done with the phase. Everybody has left. And so let's just shut down. So that's, that's how you terminate things, is by on advance. That's the typical way you terminate stuff. Now, you can also see it's passed in the phase number. And you can use that this is the current phase, right? So you, you're like, or you, maybe it's the next phase. But you just completed a phase. And so it passes in the phase number. And you can compare that against an iteration count to see if you're done. So this is how you could do fixed iterations. You could do a cyclic barrier that would keep advancing until you hit a certain constant or a certain value. OK, so that's what on advance does. Now, on advance um, basically decides whether you can go forward. And it also, of course, as a side effect, the controls termination, right? So if you can't go forward, then you terminate, right? Um, now, this is a little bit funky. It returns true if it wants to not advance. <laughs> so it, they should have called it something else besides on advance. It should have been like decide whether to advance, continue, you know, decide whether to continue advance or not. <laughs> and then you could return true or false. But if you return true, you stop. If you return false, you continue. That's one thing. The other thing is, and this is something that you'll see in a minute, makes life very complicated. Um, while on advance is being called back, there's a bunch of restrictions on the methods it can call. So while on advance is being called, you can't call other, other methods, like do registering yourself and so on and so forth. I'm not exactly sure why that is. But the long and the short of it is it makes certain things more complicated, as you will soon see. But you can always find clever workarounds. So on advance has sort of these properties that it, it's limited in what could be called back in its context. The default implementation shuts down if there are no registered parties, which makes perfect sense. right? If there's nobody waiting, then why even bother sticking around? All right, so those are the main operations. So let's take a look at a bunch of different examples. The first couple examples, as we'll see here, come straight out of the documentation. And I'm just going to explain them. That's my value added to what's in the documentation. And then the next, document the next example will be my thread gang thing, which is way more complicated and more complete than the examples that are in the documentation. So the first example shown here is a one-shot phaser. So we have a method called run tasks that's given a list of runnables. And the first thing we do is we make a phaser with a party count of one for ourselves. So we are, we are going to um, basically, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to wait. So, so we, we are included, right? We don't have to register because we, we had a count of one. We then go and we iterate through the list of tasks. And for everything in this list, we register the party with the phaser. And this, this call could actually go down here, but we'll put it here for sake of argument. So we register the party. For every, par every task, we register it. Then we go ahead and we create a new thread. And when that thread runs, it will go ahead and arrive and await advance. So it will then go and say, can I start yet? Can I start? Is it OK to start? Right? And um, of course, it won't be able to start yet because all the threads haven't arrived. In fact, one important thread hasn't arrived. That's the thread that's controlling all this stuff. right? <laughs> so what's going to happen here is all of those threads, all those threads will be started. They'll all be basically chomping at the bit, ready to go. They're all waiting on this barrier. And then finally, um, after all the threads are, are started, now the threads may or may not be running yet, but the threads are all started, then this guy comes along and says, arrive and deregister. 
So that'll, of course, decrement the count by 1. So now, after everybody's shown up here, and the last guy hits arrive and await advance, the burial will be released, and they'll all be able to run whatever it is they need to do. Yeah? So it's kind of like semaphore in that it keeps track of a count, but not, it doesn't differentiate like what the count, I guess, which, which number is specified for each thread? When the count, yeah, it's just a count. Whenever the count reaches the magic number, um, which, which in, you know, when the guy gets along and, and the last guy shows up, then everybody can go and do their thing. And, and you'll see in a second uh, what happens when that occurs is there's a chance to call this hook method, and then it decides whether they'll be able to continue on to the next <laughs> cycle or not. Yeah? yeah so then, so it's, it, it continues or it, it advances whenever the uh, number of registered uh, as users or whatever. Parties. Parties. Yes. Yeah. So, so the when the number of well, when the number of parties, when the number of registered parties, and we'll see that registration can happen a couple different ways. When the number of registered parties equals the number of arrived parties, then everybody can advance. Hey, I mean, if you think about it, it makes sense, right? You you're organizing something, and the thing is, when everybody shows up, we're going to go on a campout or something like that, and so you have to wait for everybody to show up. And you have a count in advance of how many people will show up. I mean, think about you know, taking third graders to a, to a park or something. You, know, you don't want to leave before they all show up. And you don't want to leave the park before they all get rounded up to go back. So you have a list that keeps track of how many there are. And as they show up, then you say, oh, you know, check them off the list one by one. In this case, you don't really check off individuals. You just say, do I have what looks like six kids? Great, we're going. You know, I don't really care which six they are. You know. <laughs> We'll take somebody else's kids. We got six of them, though. Um, so keep in mind here, going back to Jake's point, phaser count equal one. So the number of parties, registered parties, is one. Then for everybody in the task list, they all add themselves, right? If, if a guy adds himself and comes down here and starts to run, he cannot run because this guy hasn't deregistered yet, right? So he can't make progress. When this guy deregisters, then when the last guy arrives, then we can start. OK, so that's one model. Here's an example of a cyclic phaser. So a cyclic phaser works a little bit differently. Um, well, it works in a more convoluted manner. It's not necessarily more, a different way to do things. This is also from the documentation. So we start out by making a new phaser. Now notice, that, notice in this case, uh, a couple things. First, we take a list of tasks, a list of runnables, and a number of iterations that we want to iterate. And we allocate ourselves a new phaser, but notice there's no initial parties registered here at all. So there's, it's zero. It defaults to zero, right? That's the number of parties. And we also define a method called onAdvance. And this ad onAdvance method will get called back when the last party has arrived, right? So this guy, this is what's going to determine whether we go to the next phase, if you will. Um, and so in this particular case, we check to see if phase, which is just the phase count, equals the max iterations. And if it's greater than or equal to it, and or the number of parties is 0, then we return true, in which case we're going to stop after this phase. We're not going to advance the barrier. right? OK, so now we come down here. And the thread that's the, the starting up thread guy, he goes ahead and registers himself to defer the worker thread's starting. So he does this so that they won't just start running, right? Once again, we have a, a list of tasks. And we go and each task gets registered with the phaser. And then they get started, so they run, you know, they start the thread. And he, once again, he does the arrive and await advance thing. The difference here from what we had before. So before, remember, we had a one-shot guy, right? And the one-shot guy looked like this. So the thread got started. It waited for its chance to run. It ran, and then it stopped. It evaporated after it ran. In this model, however, you'll notice that this thread here gets to go in a do-while loop. And he's going to keep running the task and waiting until the phaser is terminated. 
And the phaser is terminated is, is of course determined by the on advance method. So what's going to happen here basically is um, this guy registers, he comes in, the thread is started, this guy just starts to run. So this is actually more of an ex exit barrier than an entry barrier. So he starts to run, but when he's done running, he waits for everybody else to finish running the first go around. And at that point, then while the phaser is not terminated, all the threads that are running these tasks all get a chance to keep running. So they keep, you know, they all get a chance to run, then they all stop on the barrier. And then there's a decision, you know, do we advance? Yes. We loop back around again. Um, and so while we're not terminated, we then run the next phase of whatever we're doing. And when we're all done, we all block on our barrier. We wait and see what happened. And then we check to see if we've been terminated. If not, we go back around. So that's basically the life cycle of this thing. And keep that in mind, because that's basically what the thread gang framework is doing. It's just generalizing the use of the, the mechanisms quite a bit. So you keep looping until you're terminated. You're terminated when this guy returns true, when the on advance method returns true. On advance is a little bit like the barrier action from the cyclic barrier. Jonathan. Hi, so I was going to ask, so the, um, the fact that we have run before the arrive and wait advance, it's just saying it's like an exit barrier and if it's the bit that's like, so the other one was an entry barrier. Exactly. Yep, and I mean you you could put you could have another one there if you wanted to if you wanted to start everybody at the same time and then have them wait you could have two barriers. In fact, I think uh, other examples for cyclic barrier do that in the documentation. So, on advance is a little bit like the barrier action with one key difference. Remember, the barrier action gave you a chance to do something whenever the uh, whatever you were trying to decide whenever the barrier reached where it was. Um, but it wasn't really controlling whether the thing looped around again. It was just giving you a hook to run. Now, you could also program it to do that. But the on advance method is more flexible. And it's also giving you this opportunity to kind of control what happens, whether you continue onwards or not. Now, the last thing that happens here, but this is actually you know, concurrent with all this stuff that's going on, this guy comes along and deregisters himself. And that, of course, means that uh, when this guy goes away, then these guys can then return from the exit barrier to check to see whether they've been terminated, and if not, loop back around again. Yes, Dana. Yeah. So on advance gets called. Actually, I will show you exactly when on advance gets called. Let's go take a look. Await advance. And so somewhere on here, here we go. There's on advance. So on advance is getting called back in arrive and await advance. And so what's happening here is that once everybody has arrived, while the lock is still held, then on advance gets called. So on advance is going to get called um, before the arrive and await advance method returns. Well, it'll still ex execute them while loop, right? So, so no, no, no. So your question is, um, let's, let's make it easy. Let's say that there's two tasks, right? So we have our phaser. And it starts out with 0 as its party count. The first guy comes along and registers. So this becomes 1. We then go ahead and spawn two threads. Here are little threads. This other thread is running, of course, the main thread. These two threads are spawned. They have both registered, so the, the current count is 3. And they spawn. Uh, so, so the current count is 3. The threads are spawned. These guys are running. They do their thing. And then they come along, and they block on arrive and await advance, which currently has a value of 3, let's say. So both of these guys are blocked on that. The main thread comes along, calls arrive and deregister which causes this thing to go down to 2. At that point, there are two waiters. The value is 2. At that point, then, the on advance call is made, and a decision is made about whether to go to the next phase or not. And then when that returns, as you can see, when this thing returns, the decision has already been made about whether to go on to the next phase. If the decision is to 
go on to the next phase or the next cycle, this call will be false because you won't have been terminated. So you loop back around again and you run the, the run method. And now you just have two, two parties, so it's, it's easier. Um, once you have realized you're at the end of your rope when you're done, then this guy will return true because on advance will have returned true, if that makes sense. No, this one, the task run will get run before everybody waits. The oh, the previous one, yeah, the, the previous one, yeah, the previous one. Yep, so this is more of an entry barrier. It doesn't let you get to this point until, until you okay. all have shown up. Yeah. And then this one is more of an exit barrier where after you do your thing, you decide if you're going to keep going or not. Okay. Yep. Okay, any other questions about that? So now let's take a look at a really complicated example, which is way cooler, I think, than the other ones. Um, this is the thread gang model. And you can look at the code. So this example is different from the previous ones because unlike the other two, which used a fixed number of, of parties, either for one shot or cyclic, this uses a variable number of parties. And what it's going to be able to do is it's going to be able to keep searching the input, you know, multiple iterations. And not only is it going to have multiple iterations, so it's, it's cyclic, but you can control how many threads are dedicated to the processing. And the way we're going to do that is by how much input there is. So you'll see in a second how that works. So the number of strings to process can differ on each cycle. So let's say we have five, let's say we have four to start out with, and then we have three, et cetera. So here's how this is going to work. And we're also, by the way, going to use a, a countdown latch as well as a phaser. This, this actually should say phaser, not barrier. Um, it's a barrier, but it's a phaser. So the logic is the same. So we're not doing anything different from what we did before. We're basically um, going to run in a background thread, and we're going to go ahead and take a look at all the words, and we're going to check to see if the words we're looking for are in the input that we're given. However, the number of worker threads and vector elements can differ on each cycle. So we started out where we had four worker threads and four elements in the vector. And then after we ran one cycle, then we only had three sources of input next time. So now we're going to get rid of a thread and rid of a vector element, and we're going to process with those. So now, of course, we're going to have a phaser with a value of three instead of four. And likewise, we could add some more. We could have six instead of four or whatever. And things expand or contract as needed to do the trick. We use a phaser to wait for each thread to finish its cycle. So what happens here is there's a worker done hook method that we'll see that gets called back after the, the work is done in the background. And that's an exit barrier, so it waits to see what happens. And the on advanced method, which is you'll see is much more complicated than the other one, is going to go ahead and, and do a bunch of stuff. Um, and then depending on what on advanced does, we're going to end up basically potentially reconfiguring things. And that itself is going to use a cyclic barrier, as you'll see. So we're going to use a cyclic barrier to control reconfiguration. Now, the, the thing that makes this tricky, and it, it's really kind of cool how it all worked out, and it was nice because all the other parts of the framework just came along for the ride. Um, we're either shrinking the number of threads and shrinking the size of the vector, in which case we have to tell running threads to shut themselves down, or we're expanding the vector and expanding the number of threads to process each element in the vector, in which case we have to spawn some new threads. In either case, if reconfiguration has to take place, there's an additional little dance that, takes, that goes on. And you'll see how that works when I look at the code. We ultimately use a countdown latch to wait for all the threads to finish all the cycles. So the advance the next cycle method, which is the one that controls the, the thread's outermost loop, that checks to see if the phaser has been terminated. And if it has been, it decrements the countdown latch by one, in which case it then lets the main thread of control that was blocked waiting await thread gang done. That guy can wake up and continue. OK, so that, that's the high level view of what's going on. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the code. And first, actually, let me run the code for you just to prove to you it, it actually does what I say it does. All right, so here is, oh yeah. Ah, it's very, very pleasant. All right, let's see. Okay, 
So here's the code. Here's thread gang test. And here is the input that we're going to use for the variable number of strings. So you can see here, this always goes backwards, by the way. It's just easier that way. So the first time through, we're going to have three input strings, which could be much bigger than what I have here, but there are three of them. The next two times, we have two input strings. Then we have four input strings. And finally, we have one input string. So that's the input. OK, so Java, C star Java. Java thread gang test. OK. There you go. All right. So we start the phaser. And the first time through, we had three threads, thread 10, 11, and 12. Then the next time through, we only had two threads. So one thread goes away. The next time through, we had the same number of threads. So we reuse them. Now we have four threads compared to two threads. So some new threads get spawned. And you can see that we have threads uh, 13 and 14. 12 has gone away because we shut that one down up here. So we start with 13 and 14. And then the last time through, we just had one set of input. So we only have one thread. So each time through, it's, it's adaptively changing what it's doing with uh, the input. All right, so let's go take a look at the code. So we will look for phaser. All right, so here's the search phaser thread gang. It's got a phaser, which is what's being used to control it as a barrier. It's got a volatile reconfiguration int. And we use this to decide whether we have to trigger reconfiguration. Why do we have to make it volatile? Why, why do we have to make it? Well, maybe when you see it, you'll understand why we have to make it volatile. We have a cyclic barrier that's used to control the reconfiguration. And then we have a countdown latch that's used to control whether the main thread can exit when everybody else is done with all their phases, all their cycles. All right, so we use every one of the, the mechanisms here. Here's the constructor. Uh, it sets reconfiguration to 0 because we don't need a reconfiguration to start with. It figures out how many iterations it's going to run. It creates an exit latch, which it's going to use to control the main thread. And now we make a phaser. And this is where things get really crazy. So we make a phaser. The phaser starts out with 0. So it, it's going to rely on things registering. And its on advance method is defined here. This turns out to be a perfectly fine place to use it, to define it. And what its on advance method does is it first checks to see how big the current vector of input is. So we say, how big are you? And we go ahead and then we set the vector of input to the new input. So we, we've just got done, you know, we just got done with a phase. We're going to take the old stuff, we're going to set it to the new stuff. And then we go and we check to see whether or not we're done. So if there's no more data, if, the, if there's no more data and there are no more registered parties, we're out of here. The whole thing's going to shut down. That's fine. What we then do is we check to see what the vector's size is. This is the new vector. And we see, has it gotten bigger or smaller? So we figure that out basically by subtracting new size from old size. If new size minus old size is 0, we're done, right? It didn't require any reconfiguration. So we just put a message saying, starting the new cycle, same number of threads, no problem. If we're either bigger or smaller, then we have to go ahead and do something else. And I can probably optimize this just a little bit. Um, but what I do then is I create a new cyclic barrier with old size number of threads. So the idea here is we've got, um, we've got our existing phaser. And let's say that we have uh, a count of four. So we've got four parties that have to be part of this. And now let's say that the new input is six. We've got six threads, so it's going to go up. So in that case, we're going to create a new cyclic barrier with a count of four. These are the existing threads. And we then go ahead and create a barrier action. And here's what the barrier action looks like. This is in the cyclic barrier. The barrier action, keep in mind, this is going to get triggered when all four threads that are existing threads go and await on the cyclic barrier. 
when that happens, when this gets run, if old size is less than new size, then we go ahead and kick off a bunch more threads. So if new threads came along, we're going to make some new threads, and those guys are going to get a chance to run. Now, it turns out we don't really care if those guys go ahead and start. We're not going to make them wait. They can start, but we're going to have to wait, and you'll see why in a second. So these threads go ahead and start up. And then we also indicate that eh, we don't need any more reconfigure. Uh, reconfiguration is over. We're, we're finished with reconfiguration. Keep in mind, this is going to get run when all the old threads show up at the reconfiguration barrier. OK. So that's the constructor. Here's get next input. It just reads the next set of input as a vector. Here's initiate thread gang. That goes ahead and kicks off n threads. So let's say we start out with four threads. We have four threads that are now running. Here is worker done. Now, if you recall, thread gang, the thread gang main loop for all the worker threads looks like this. They run in a separate thread. They get the next chunk of data to work on in their part of the vector, their index into the vector. They get their next element to work on. They run in the background for however long they need to run. And when they're done, they call a hook method called worker done. And that's where the magic happens. Okay, so worker done says, I'm done. Tell me what to do next. Now, in a lot of cases, what worker done does is it just sits there and it waits for everybody else to show up as a barrier. And when it's done, it then decides whether to loop around or not. But in the case where things are growing and shrinking, there's more work to be done. Also keep in mind that there's this, um, we'll talk about the exception here in a second. That's how you're going to return. And you keep running until you're instructed to stop. And you, you're instructed to stop here when the phaser has been terminated. OK, so that's, that's the generic part of the code. Here's the specialized part. Here's worker done. When worker done gets called back, every thread that's calling back onto worker done goes to the, the phaser and says, await, uh, arrive and await advance. It says, I'm here. Let's wait till everybody's here. So when everybody shows up, Remember what happens when everybody shows up. When the final guy shows up, the on advance method gets called back. And on advance then decides if we have to reconfigure or not. So when on advance returns, reconfiguration is either zero or non-zero. This is why we needed it to be done as a volatile. Because we have to make sure it's either zero or non-zero. We can't let it be some inconsistent state. right? So, and, and, uh, and it turns out that a volatile works just fine for that. So if we need to reconfigure, then all the existing threads need to wait on the reconfiguration barrier. Now keep in mind that the, the other threads um, haven't gotten this far yet, so they, they don't have to worry about that. The new th any new threads that have been created are, are off doing something else, and they're in a different phase anyway. Um, the reconfiguration barrier then says wait for all the existing threads, and if the index of the thread, which is what's passed up here, if, if I am no longer needed because the vector shrank, right? If, if, I was, if the vector was 4 before and now it's 2, and I was index 3, if that's the case, if my index is greater than or equal to the size of the vector, and by the way, vector.size is a synchronized operation, so we don't have to worry about race conditions there. If that's the case, then I'm going to go tell the phaser, Take me out of consideration. I don't have to be here anymore. We just got smaller, so take me out. So I arrive and deregister. And then I say, oh, and by the way, please throw an exception when you're done. And when this guy gets down to the bottom here, if an exception is needed, he throws the index out of bounds exception. So the worker done method throws the index out of bounds exception, which as you see here, causes the make worker run method, or the runnable, it's created by make worker. The run method then is going to have an exception raised. That exception will be caught here, and that thread will exit. So that's how we get threads who don't, are no longer needed because we just shrank the input to shut themselves down automatically. So they shut themselves down automatically. So new threads are added by spawning new threads. They go ahead and run, and they'll block on the next phase of the barrier. Um, of the phaser, and then the old threads then get rid of themselves if they're no longer needed. So anyway, I had a lot of fun writing this. It was, um, took a while to figure it all out, but the main thing that was hard was you cannot call 
what I wanted to be able to do is I wanted to be able to do all this reconfiguration inside of on advance because that was the most obvious place to do it. But you can't make calls back to the phaser in the context of on advance. And I had to be able to deregister myself. I had to get, my, get rid of myself. And that just caused a deadlock. So I came up with this crazy scheme for having on advance indicate reconfiguration is needed. I created a cyclic barrier to do the reconfiguration. And then I returned knowing that when I got done, I would be able to pick up in worker done and know to reconfigure myself. So pretty cool stuff. Yeah? Why did you use a cyclic barrier instead of just a, a one shot? Because I needed to have the barrier action. I needed to have the barrier action get run. That's, that's actually a great question. So <coughs> my, my, here's my barrier action. When I wanted to have all the threads wait, and when all the existing threads got to the barrier, I wanted an action to be called. Now, I, I probably could also rewrite that to use a, I might be able to rewrite that to use a countdown latch, and that might make it a little cleaner. But this just seemed like the obvious thing to do. So I was like, oh, cool. You know, I, now I can throw in cyclic barrier, too. We'll use them all. OK, so that's, that's that for Thread Gang. You now know more than most people on the face of the earth about phasers, which are very mysterious and very complicated, very powerful, but also very mysterious. And you've got a good analogy to remember the difference between arriving and waiting. So Disney World Darth Vader exhibit.